तुम घर जाके बच्चे पैदा करो तुम्हारा दिमाग उतना ही है तुम जाके रोटियां बनाओ इट टुक मी अ लॉर्ड ऑफ एफर्ट फाइट टू पास माय मेडिकल दे सेड बिकॉज यू हैव अ डिसेबिलिटी यू कैन नॉट जॉय आई रिमेंबर वंस आई वेंट टू वोट एंड समबडी शाउटिंग ऑन टॉप अरे हैंडीकैप्ड है देख लो दिस इज सो कॉमन सो मेनी ऑफ आर वेल एजुकेटेड कॉर्पोरेट वुमेन have gone through immense battles in their lives because of the social norms your whole system has been now conditioned that you're going to prove yourself mm. and you keep doing that and you don't stop because the moment they stop the system is going to right now revert right back to what it was right do you fear that that's happening it's not happening right now because women are not letting it happen mm. The time that I was going to receive the Padma Shri, when I was walking up to the president, suddenly my own whole life looked like a story which had been written somewhere. In today's episode of Conversations Cafe podcast, uh, we have a very very special guest with us. We have Dr. Neeru Kumar, who is uh, a Padma Shri and who has been a doctor. Uh, for almost 25 years of her life but that alone does not define what she has done in her life spoken to many many sessions she has traveled the world and she talks more about why diversity in a workplace is so crucial we talked about gender we talked about pay gaps if you find this particular podcast to be too long don't be afraid because we have a clips channel and you can look at the shorts that we publish on this particular channel as well make sure to hit the subscribe button on both of these channels to get updated about when the new videos come and do tell us which are the other guests that you would like to see in conversations cafe podcast this particular season the podcast with padma shri dr neeru kumar starts with 3 2 1 I'm going to uh, take you to the field that we operate in. Uh, we are mostly, primarily, in the management education space. Uh, I go and talk to a lot of students in B schools across the country, where I get a sense that you know, a lot of these B schools are now trying to get more women to be part of their courses because they have probably uh, made sense of the fact that you need a gender inclusive classroom. right and they probably have seen the uh, positive implications of it and that's how they want to keep increasing the number in some cases it seems like it's a brownie point for them that they want to achieve and on the other hand when you talk to the students it feels like they feel that their rightfully owned or earned seat is being taken by this coat uncoat which is not written gender reservation that's there in these peace schools <laughs> what well, is i face this every day yeah every single day hmm? so here it is 16 years back when i started the work on inclusion at that time there used to be very tough conversations so if i walk into an organization whichever level hmm. whether it's the top leaders or the front line in the plants the conversation was why should women uh be be really encouraged hmm. i'm not even saying force why should they be encouraged to come into the workplace the indian system always has been that the roles are divided the male is the breadwinner the woman is the caretaker of the house children are so much happier and healthier if the mother is at home these were the conversations at that time yeah some people even said women should decide hmm. whether they want to have children or whether they want to work so those were some tough conversations which i had to do and i think what was really gratifying for me is that if i had a whole day like if i was doing a workshop for a full day by the end of the day itself in one day itself i could see a change mm-hmm. a paradigmal shift happening okay and people would <clears throat> stand up and say i mean i think maybe that's my blessing that that influence was there mm. so they would stand up and say you know i came in a different person and i'm going back a different person okay right. so things started changing not only because of the sessions i was doing but there were the momentum started picking up mm. and there were more and more people who started coming 
into this field. Uh, I think formally, if you talk about DEI, I'm, I was among the first in India to start this conversation, right. right? So, but then what happened, we had five, six years of what seemed like a golden period, seemed like. In those years, we saw organizations, men, everybody really now vouching for this and saying this should be done, it's the right thing to do, and all of that. Mm. So, sessions. What is the time period that we're talking about? So, we are talking about um, till, okay, let's say, Till two years mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. a five year period. Okay. Till two years. Got back. it, got it. Yeah. So, what year would that be? So 2017 to 22, probably. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from the last two years, I'm seeing this pushback, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That the insecurity sentiment is now really rising. Yeah. Now, we should really think about it why. Yeah. Is it that people are really thinking that now there's no need, mm. that now it's all sorted and now women are empowered, empowered intelligent, uh, educated, they don't need any extra prop, they don't need that equity we keep talking about. Mm. Hmm? Or is it that there is an element of insecurity? Correct. Or it could be both. But I suspect it's more of the insecurity. Because women are really proving their mettle now. And they're really coming up in a very dynamic and forceful way. Mm. But again, that's a selected few. Two things to be really thought about here. One, it's a selected few. That's not, if you're talking about India, then it's not the whole country you're talking about. Correct. It's only a very, very small cross section. Yeah. Right? And two, what they don't know is, that the constant battle of facing the biases and managing the dual responsibilities they have at home and also the social expectations which are much more judgmental and much more harsh on women than on men. All this takes a toll. You're very determined, you have a grit, you go on, you go on doing, you go on proving, you go on doing. But deep inside there's also a kind of eroding that's happening. And that leads to emotional ill health, mm. well-being is not there. And it also leads to a time when they want to give up. Yeah. So, you know, Paul, uh, I think any person from a diversity group, whoever it may be, whether you call it disability or you call it socioeconomic or you call it caste or you call it anything, they may have risen, they may have fought many battles, people may be admiring them. People may be very inspired by them, but there's also an exhaustion somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because the backlog of the past never goes away. Yeah. And also, if you say, oh, you have fought so many battles, <laughs> it's easy to say that. But somewhere the impact has been there. And perhaps that thing of proving never completely goes away. And I'm saying that for myself also. It never completely goes away. That your whole system has been now conditioned that you're going to prove yourself. Mm. And you keep doing that and you don't stop. Yeah, so we, it's the same for women. And if they're doing that, still doing that, because the moment they stop, the system is going to right now revert right back to what it was. Right. Do you fear that that's happening? It's not happening right now because women are not letting it happen. Mm. And luckily for us, we are getting a lot of support from the government. We are getting a lot of support from uh, the corporates. Systems are now doing tremendous work on it. So therefore, it's not happening right now that we are going back. But we can. The moment we say, if prematurely we say that we are sorted, and now that so-called reservation is not needed, gender targets are not needed, mm. gender quotas are not needed, gender policies are not needed. The moment we say that, it's going to revert right back. Absolutely. It's too early, it's too premature. I have a critical lens of looking at it and probably you can shed some light on how it, the, the structure is changing. Uh, talking about specifically corporates give you a very grim picture about the gender gap or the wage gap that's existing right now, mm. right? When you look at top level positions, women are not there. When you look at 
uh, boardrooms, there are men with grey hair sitting making decisions <laughs> for women, right? And that's, yes. that's reality that has been yes. happening for decades. Yes. So when you say that there is change, <coughs> where is the change and how is that change happening? So even if you talk about the pay gap, hmm? uh, we made slight shifts, not too many, hmm. but we made slight shifts. The, if women were earning 48% less than men a few years back, now the number is 33% less. Okay. Well, it's encouraging. It's a small win, but it's encouraging. If you talk about women in leadership positions, slightly better there also. Not too much, but slightly better. Boardrooms and CXO level, yes, has to still see a major change. There the shift is very slight. Yeah? But if you start looking at representation of women at every level, it's increasing. The participation is increasing. Certain functions, like women in sales, you couldn't see any women there. Women in shop floors, manufacturing units, you couldn't see anything. Now we are having uh, full plants run by women. Yeah. We are having women as plant heads. I work with a lot of manufacturing units. Um, a company like Hindalco of the Aditya Birla group, we saw a major turnaround. We did a large rollout and we saw a major turnaround. Then there were other country, uh, companies like Jubilant Inc. Revia, again. One of the things that really worked in these companies is the leadership taking complete ownership. Mm. So the difference I see between companies who are actually achieving true authentic goals and not just a tick mark is that the leaders invest a lot of their time and energy into understanding these themes and understanding how to be the champions. So for example, we go into certain organizations where they say, our leaders don't have the time. Mm. And you will get them only for 90 minutes. And I say, that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or they say, okay, you'll get them for maximum half a day. Yeah. E even that is not at all good enough. Mm. But there have been leaders, if I'm talking about Hindalco, if I'm talking about PepsiCo, if I'm talking about Jubilant and Grevia, and many such organizations where we worked with. Now we are doing a big rollout with the Mahindra Group. Yeah. Just yeah. yesterday, I did uh, a session with the top leaders of Mahindra Auto. And these people are going through a whole five to six month journey. We've done similarly in Unilever, where the top leaders are investing as much as five to six months mm. in going through an inclusive leadership journey. So it's like uh, at intervals, but they want to go deeper and deeper. And they're open to doing, let's say, a 360 assessment where they're willing to see their blind spots. They're willing to take the feedback. And one thing which is critical for inclusive leadership is willingness and openness to take feedback. Yeah. You cannot decide how inclusive you are. It's your people who have to decide how inclusive you are. If a leader is willing to be open to that, that's, that's a great shift. So. So I would say, I was saying that these are some of the places and some of the corporates where the genuine work has been done and the shift that has happened, in my opinion, and that's going to be a sustained shift. It's not going to be temporary. How do I know? So for example, if I'm joining a company, how do I know what I'm stepping into? How do I know? How yeah. do I assess that, you know, it's a company that is more inclusive and it will be open to the ideas that I have without kind of being very aggressive and shooting it down? That's, that's a very tough question really because there are companies today who are branding themselves as inclusive employers through various um, awards. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the best way is to do an internship there. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what should you look at? If you're going to look at only representation, that might still not be authentic inclusion. Mm. I've had the experience of walking into an organization who had hired a number of people with disabilities. And when I spoke to them, they were not included. So they have the deep pockets to be able to hire and still it's tokenism. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it is going to be a respectful workplace mm. for all people 
is something that you will have to experience either through the hearsay of your friends or by going and doing an internship there. It is good to one, one part of it is of course, that you have read up about them and how inclusive they are, what is their representation, what is the work they have done, but it is still only one part. You have to hear it from a person who has experienced it. Right. Uh, I do not know whether you are aware of uh, this individual, his name is Simon Sinek. And I have. Yeah. And he is pretty famous over the internet and some of his talks really make sense. And one of the interviews that I was watching of Simon, he actually said that inclusion means you allow perspectives to bloom, right? And yeah. diversity means that you are allowing different ideas yeah. for the same problem to kind of being heard yeah. and, you know, taken note of. Yeah. In a society like ours, where we always kind of, you know, think about profits first. Hmm. Do you think this is achievable or it is a far fetched dream that we are chasing? I am not seeing the two as different. I think the moment you understand the beauty of diversity of thought, profit comes automatically. Hmm. In fact, you need diversity of thought for staying alive in a competitive world like this. Yeah. You, today you can't do without it. You are not going to be innovative. You are not going to be able to serve your customers and your clients unless your workforce mirrors that. Your marketing campaigns need to reflect that you are thinking about inclusion all the time. You are mm -hmm. thinking about diversity all the time. Yeah? That's how Apple became Apple. That's how Apple became Apple. Unilever does campaigns like Hindu Muslim bonding over a cup of red label chai. Mm. Yeah. So, those are the things that have to be done constantly, all the time. So, I do not see that diversity is just a moral or noble thing to do. It has got a hardcore business case to it. Professor Scott Page of Michigan University has done huge research on this and he gives fantastic uh, toolkits of the diversity toolkit that how people uh, can leverage diversity of thought for better business. Yeah, so it's not it's not a part, it's the same thing. In in doing a lot of these sessions that you are part of, probably for years now, what has been one of these outrageous events in your life or something that has happened that has really triggered you? I think what I just mentioned, uh, if you say the word trigger, perhaps that was one two places I'll say. Okay. One was this just what I just mentioned a bit back that you've got a large population of people with disabilities and nobody's listening to them. Hmm. Hmm? And they are told that you should be thankful you've got what you have. Hmm. Don't ask for more. A lot has been done for you. Hmm? So, we talk about reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities in the workplace. There were none there. And you can't possibly hire so many people with disabilities and not be sensitive to their lived experience. Yeah. And not be meticulous about providing the reasonable accommodation. It should not be patronizing, it should not be a favor, they should not be indebted. Right? Because that feeling of indebted, then you will never speak up. The speak up culture will never come. One point you feel indebted, rest of the time you will keep silent. Yeah. So, that was one. And the other place was that as an organization I found that women were so disrespected. Mm. If a woman escalates something, the grapevine says she is a troublemaker, mm. however genuine it may be. So, now two kinds of escalation. One is about the obvious biases that happen. You are not given the proper opportunity or you did the whole project, somebody else goes and presents it. You are not given the credit for it. You are never allowed to come client facing. So, those are the opportunity issues that happen. The other are the posh issues that happen, the sexual harassment issues that happen. Even they in that particular organization was a woman goes and reports it 
and she gets ice cold behavior from everybody in the organization and now her opportunities go down even more. The other thing that happened in that organization because as a result of this was people did not even have any control over their language. Mm. The language which they were using with women was atrocious. Tum ghar ja ke bachche paida karo. Tum ja ke tumhara dimag utna hi hai tum ja ke rotiyan banao. Mm. Somebody once said uh, have you seen the movie Three Idiots? Well you are one of those. these kind of remarks being passed at women and what is really frustrating is when you go and address it people say oh it doesn't happen to women alone it happens to men also and this is this is an argument that comes up again again mm. it happens and no matter how much you're trying to show the Maybe. the results and the data and say look this is the data we are not saying this subjectively no 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 it's a vehement argument no 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 it's happening to men also yeah so a very very disrespectful workplace i was actually doing a woman development journey in that and i would hear the voices of women and telling me such things all the time and i i was insisting i want to do a leadership session here till date that's not happened mm. so i was insisting i want to do a leadership session here let me talk to the to the environment because this must go parallelly when you're developing women it's needed it's needed for certain reasons but at the same time the environment has to become inclusive Correct. both the things you can't just fix the women and say the environment remains what it is yeah so those were the two organizations where i would say it was a trigger however like i said right in the beginning anger radicalism prevents you from doing the work you're doing right what helps is thinking of creative solutions So what I did was, um, I'd done the diagnostics of that particular group of women, and I said, okay, let me create a group report. So I created a group report, and then I requested them, okay, we're not doing leadership sessions with you, but I want to show your leaders this group report. Mm. So I got them into the room for 90 minutes, and I showed them that, and that there was stunned silence after that. Really, this happened here because sometimes. the top leaders are not aware of it yeah it's more as you go down i mean not i'm not saying right to the front line or individual contributors at the manager level it can be huge yeah so those were the two triggers yes if i'm a manager how do i become a better manager because you know now i have all of a sudden been given responsibility of managing 6 7 people right and i have no clue because i have been working under someone for so long and i don't know what works what doesn't to manage seven different people who are coming in from different uh, walks of the life yeah so the one mantra i would say ask don't assume hmm? you may be a very good intentioned manager who wants to do a lot for the people hmm. and you land up doing things for them which they don't even want yeah so many times we hear women are not posted to certain places because it will be too tough for them. Ah. Huh? Mm. They don't want that or mm. give them light roles and projects because they've just come back from maternity. Mm. They don't want that. Mm. Maybe they've got a support system at home which is really good. So how do you get to know that? By inviting them for a conversation and listening to their lived experience. Right. Now, and I'm saying this to managers and leaders every day, don't shy away from asking and inviting people sometimes we want to do it but we are shy we feel awkward we say how do i ask a person with disability come and tell me about your experience mm. hmm? you have to get over that hesitation if you are a manager or how do i ask a woman or how do i ask a person maybe who's got a, a introvert communication style or who's from the lgbtq plus community how do i ask them yeah or maybe you're just suspecting and that person has not come out mm. what do you do it's a very tough situation right yeah you invite them and say what well if if you're really feeling your intuition is telling you something and you're also looking around and feeling that this person may not be really included you just invite that person and say you know is there anything in your experience in the team that you would like to share for me 
with me. I am here to listen and I am here to support. Maybe that is that little nudge that person needs to open up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, how can I support is a very powerful sentence rather than like I said, do not assume ask. Mm. Right. How can I help? There was this Netflix series New Amsterdam mm. and Max the medical director he is always saying how can I help and the, it is also the tone and the body language, the energy just flows to the other person and they know that this person is really there in a respectful way to support. Okay, um, we were talking about workplace inclusion, we were talking about the corporate spaces in general and sometimes religion also becomes a very difficult subject to address, right? I mean, uh, you coming in from a different religion, uh, all of a sudden the tension builds when common discussions around this happen and speci especially when that religion is a minority. Right. Uh, one is in a country like India, should there be a problem like this in a workplace and two is how as someone who is running this organization I should look into it. Okay, so honestly I have not seen it in the corporate sector, I have not seen it as a huge issue. Hmm. Social sector very big, okay. many of our all our WhatsApp groups are exploding with such kind of conversations. Hmm. I feel embarrassed to say that even my, med I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor to begin with, you yeah, know that. Yeah. Even in my medical fraternity, sometimes we see not so good things happening. But for some reason in the corporate, it's not that much. Hmm. I think uh, there could be a few reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, one is that as students, all of you come from institutions or are very open to friendships with people from all sectors and religions yeah. and as soon as you get into the workplace, you continue to maintain that and you set the tone there. You have never been out into the world as uh, entrepreneurs mm. or any other profession yeah. and you have gone straight into the corporates, mm. many of you. Yeah? So therefore, that is not there, that tolerance towards religion is there. However, having said, there will always be a few pockets, however, having said that, um, the inclusion going a step further as to saying being conscious of each other's festivals or having prayer rooms where needed or being conscious if somebody is fasting, that kind of building the muscle of inclusion still needs work, mm. right? Another factor is, yes, as humans, we all like to be in groups of same. So it could happen that people from a particular religion are more in one group and another religion are in another group, where again, a little bit of conscious effort and it can be changed. So like every other form of diversity, I think the conversations on it, uh, the policies and the conversation. See, everything is a combination of policies and mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So, the combination of the policies and the mindset would be able to address this issue as well. But I do not know if it is just with me, but in my own experience, the religion aspect has not been so concerning in the corporates as the others we have been talking about gender, disability, LGBTQ, coming from small town, big town. All these are bigger issues. Right. And let me talk about one of these bigger issues and which is the homosexuals uh, working in a workplace uh, or people coming in from the LGBTQI community. Uh, you know, if we talk about gender, very minuscule improvements have uh, taken place in years of working towards this and you probably are one of the people who actually started it. Do you see enough being done on the LGBTQI side? Now. 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 And do you think that it is possible to go beyond that ticking the box saying that we have very gender inclusive workplaces where people from all walks of life walk in irrespective of their gender? Yeah. So, uh, see the good part is sometimes buzz that happens mm. is good also. Mm. Everybody is doing it, I must do it too. So, the moment people started doing work with the LGBTQ community, inviting them and uh, creating inclusion around, mm. 
then others want to do it. Hmm? Now, if you really talk to them about their own deep beliefs about the community, you'll find a lot of things there. Again, not good and bad. It's the way you've been brought up. Yeah. It's the conditioning that you've been brought up. You'll be surprised, Paul, how many people will say that I think it's peer pressure. Yeah. Or how many people will say that uh, it could be a psychological disorder. Right? So when you, when you start having conversations, they open up. The best part, even when we were talking about earlier about people resisting, saying women should be primary caretakers of home or whatever else the pushback or the rejection is for any of these aspects, I invite pushbacks. Hmm. It's only when they're able to open up and I feel very happy that in my sessions people are able to open up. In fact, many of my family members uh, joke about it and say, what is it that you do that people just come up with their life story in front of you? Hmm. So objections, resistances, whatever these resistances may be. And sometimes people are very embarrassed to talk about it. But once they start asking questions and once they open up, they're willing to learn. Mm. Then we can steer them towards a different way. How do you steer them? It's a combination of data, research, stories, examples and benefits. Yeah. When you give all of this together, then you make a change. So, see, even the whole terminology of LGBTQAI, how many people know it? Mm. The word intersex, how many people know it? The word trans, how many people really know trans? Mm. Right? So, and people are very embarrassed to ask these questions. Because these have been topics in India which have been so taboo, it's like it's like revolving around sexuality mm. and sexuality is not talked about in our homes. Yeah. So therefore, when you start talking about it, when you start understanding it, when there is the right kind of education that is given around it, two areas where I think a lot of right medical knowledge has to be given. One is neurodiversity and the neurodiversity means people with cerebral palsy, autism, okay. yeah, learning disabilities. And, and then the LGBTQ. In these two areas, you need proper scientific medical knowledge so that people are then able to understand the whole identity issue around that. Mm. One was a story, I think I've spoken about it in the TED talk. Maybe you may have heard about it, about this girl who was um, not coming out and she was so full of shame mm. because of her identity. And it needed that little nudge for her to say that she was a lesbian and all the shame that was associated around and all the bullying that she was ha that was happening because of that. And then what gave the courage to come out in the organization was an ally. If you're standing next to somebody and saying, okay, do it at your pace, but I'm here. Mm. So she came out in our own small group. We had a smaller group where we were going through a journey. The question I then asked to the rest of the group, who is willing to stand by her when she comes out in the organization? Everybody raised their hand and said, we're going to be there. And then she did come out in the organization. So that was a great example of allyship. More stories, this was a success story. Mm. But I'll also talk about stories which are very painful. Uh, you make progress when you have an opportunity to touch their lives in any ways, but it, it takes time. So, you know, uh, the, the corporate women that we see who are, when you see them, they're dressed so smartly, they're talking so well, and you think everything is in place. And suddenly you go back and hear their stories, which are so painful and sometimes the bias or the social system is reflected, so sadly reflected there. One of the stories was that the woman says, and you talked about religion, we'll talk about that mm. as well. So she said that as a girl child, um, she was not allowed to study. Mm. And she had this 
intense desire to study, but parents said, no, only brothers will study, you mm. cannot. You're going to get married and go. Started working in the house when she was five years old, making cooking at age five and six. By the time she was 14, they got her married. She was a Muslim girl. And few years later, husband has an affair with someone and leaves her. Now the divorce process for her, due to certain legalities, became a huge uphill task. It took her 13 years to get a divorce. A lifetime gone by because of the social stigmas and because of the legal system not being able to support to the extent it should. The time she was going through the divorce, she said, her parents would not come with her to the court. It's not as if she, and it was no fault of hers. The husband had an affair somewhere, mm. but the parents would not accept her back. Yeah, and she said, when I went to police of police stations, the police officers were so inappropriate. All kinds of sexual harassment issues happening over there. How many battles does one person fight alone? This is one, only one story I'm telling you all. When I do these women journeys and when they talk to me and when they open their hearts to me, this is so common. So many of our well-educated corporate women have gone through immense battles in their lives because of the social norms and are still going through those battles. I can, I can relate a hundred such stories, but that would take too long. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I would now touch upon this and then we move on to your government journey and we try and understand what is happening there. Uh, you know, we talked about the gender and the pay gap that's existing. We talked about religion, we talked about LGBTQIA, the inclusion that is needed. And you have traveled extensively across the world, right? And you must have seen that there are other ways to do it. And you must have seen that there are countries which are coming up with laws, with coming up with heavy, uh, you know, um, rules within the corporate system to make things better, you know? Yeah. In, in you know, blink, we can't change the social systems that we have built for years. And in a country like India, which is so diverse and complex, it's even more difficult. But what are some of the solutions that you can probably talk about that you have seen happening abroad where success is already there and they have seen that happening? Mm. Um, by the way, I don't think there is any country in the world which is sorted as far as the diversity issues are concerned. Mm. Okay. <laughs> that's that's sad to me. Yeah, I don't think so because as hum let's face it, as human beings, we are not inclusive. For centuries, we fought battles over territories. Mm. That still continues. Correct. Earlier, it was physical territories. Now, it's the territory of power and position. And anybody who has got power and position doesn't want to give it up. And that's the same reason, again, we talk about the fights about why quotas, why reservation, because there is a certain power and position already there which you don't want to give up. Mm. Again, no anger there, no judgment there. You and I would do the same thing maybe, mm. in small or big way, right? So in certain countries, it's an issue about race. In other countries, it's an issue about gender. But there are issues all over the world, mm. right? It's not going anywhere. So if you want me to quote um, a US or any European countries and say they're very inclusive, I don't know. Yes, Scandinavian countries have been very good as far as gender is concerned. Correct. Because after all, then again, we go back to research and data. There is a global gender gap mm. by the World Economic Forum, which measures the global gender gap is on four parameters, the economic, the health, the financial, and the political status, mm. uh, the gap between the men and women in yeah. that particular yeah. company, and then the countries are benchmarked. Scandinavia has always been on the top. They have, uh, they started their women-centric policies in 1970s. Mm. First country where uh, women started voting. 
the parental leave is like one and a half years. Either the father or the mother can take it. It's mm. not, again, the policy here, that's a good one. It's not just the mother who has to take the maternity. Maybe the father decides to be a stay-at-home dad. Correct. That is very progressive. In a way, it provides a level playing field for both. It does. Yeah. So here we have paternity leaves of 15 days and 20 days and men say, how can I participate when I'm not even at home? Mm. Yeah. So yes, as far as the gender is concerned, this country is good. But even then I show a slide in which I say, do they have enough women in senior management positions? No. Mm. Still not there. Yeah. So I don't know if it would be fair to say that the initial roles of men and women which was historically of breadwinner and family caretaker was global. Yeah. And that is still taking time to go. It's not been enough time for that to be completely erased from our memories. Many people across the globe have seen their mothers as homemakers. Mm. And that's what conditioned into their heads. Now to see women coming up into the workplace as powerfully as they are, the change needs time, it needs patience, it needs empathy for both sides. Look, you can also go into it from the historical point of view that we were in the agricultural age, then we were in the industrial age, Correct. then we were in the education age, now we are in the digital age. Earlier it was required when World War II happened, everybody, all the men went out to battle and the women had to be the entrepreneurs. Yeah? So history brings about such change and that changes the role and change takes time. Till this point that we were talking about, it happened after your stint with the government that you have had uh, as a doctor as well as a uh, serving doctor for the government, if I'm uh, not wrong. Mm, that 25 happened years. 25 years. <laughs> so tell me, what did you see back then when you were working as a doctor for the government and how were situations there? And when you compare that with today, how do you reflect on that? Yeah, yeah. So, Fortunately, in the health se sector, the gender discrimination was less, right okay. from the beginning. Hmm. You see we so see a lot of nurses. Nurses and, and even the uh, women doctors, even though we were 20 girls in a class of 180. Hmm. That so has not changed. 160 boys and 20 girls. Uh -huh. uh, that is changing a little bit because the numbers are increasing a little bit and then there are, let's say, to be fair, there are dedicated girls' colleges also. Yeah. So again, that's a matter of policy. You have to do that Correct. for to encourage hmm. more participation. But there were many, there's many a story there. When I joined medical college, um, it took me a lot of effort, fight to pass my medical, hmm. my own med physical medical examination. Okay. They said because you have a disability, you cannot join. I fought my way through that. When I passed. UPSC to get into the government cadre, again they said you cannot join. And I said, okay, why did you make me a doctor? What am I supposed to do? Become a doctor and not do a job? So it took me one year to fight that battle. They said, no, you won't be able to do home visits. And I said, but I will. So that's the question about asking and not assuming. Hmm. So there were many, for me, there were many, many battles that I had to face throughout. The clinics were not accessible at all. The uh, toilets were Indian toilets, which I could not use. Yeah. So I would not drink water, not drink tea, uh, to be in the whole time there wow. and know that you cannot use the toilet. So all that inclusion in there was zero. Uh, then about if, if there is any inappropriate behavior towards a lady doctor or a lady staff, you could not talk about that. Mm. There was a lot of old school thinking, conventional thinking in that time. So there was one incident where I was working in a VIP dispensary and there was an inappropriate behavior by a, another senior government employee. And for long, I could not speak about it. Mm. But I do remember going to one of my bosses. And this is an example to quote, because in those days, nobody talked about such things. So I went to her and I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm really upset about this. She said, why did you not talk to me before? I said, because I don't want to be named. And she said, just go home and it will be taken care of. Hmm. The officer was suspended the next day. 
and I was posted to another place. These are the kind of actions we need. Yeah, but I think for the majority of us, we could not speak about such issues at all. So there was a lot of uh, uh, gender bias here, if you can say that it would be the woman who would be blamed for anything going wrong in such a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, comparative to the rest of the world, I think the gender bias within the health sector, because once you become a doctor, the respect that you get as a doctor, that's one thing about India, you know, Dr. Saab is a very big thing. So the moment you become a doctor, I think you do enjoy that respect. There are two places where people stand in queue, one is in front of the mandirs and one in front of the, the dispensary. Yes, yes, and absolutely. That definitely was the reason why you wanted to become a doctor as well. Uh, you said that you cracked UPSC as well? In yes, your that's journey? how I came to CGHS. And were you happy in your job that you were doing there or uh, you had complaints? No, I was not happy. No, I had no complaint. <laughs> I had no complaints. I, the, I, was, uh, I had excellent relationship with my colleagues, my patients and everything, but I was not happy. Because I felt that it was not actualizing my, my whole potential. Okay. <clears throat> so, see, I was, uh, when I was in medical college, like all others, like all my other batchmates, I wanted to do post-graduation in pediatrics, gynae. I couldn't do that because years of my life were plucked away because of various issues. Uh, and so I got into the CGHS because that was one place to practice and also I had to earn a living. So, but uh, let's say the expertise, the actualization that I was searching for was not happening there. Mm. So, and I also felt that allopathic medicine was too restricted, it was not complete at all. It was not understanding the human experience. See, I've gone into various fields of human experience. I've done Reiki, I learned Reiki when it had just touched India. I taught Reiki for 23 years. Reiki healing we're talking about. Reiki healing. Mm. And uh, it is an alternative way of healing and I combined it with the conventional way of healing. Oh, wow. But Reiki also, uh, that's where my strong belief in the law of attraction comes because there's a big element of that. And there's a big element of quantum physics as well, understanding the universal energy field. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research on that. I've got a huge Reiki community. My students are almost everywhere in the world. And then I learned hypnotherapy and NLP and I became a certified teacher in hypnotherapy and NLP. So the, the hunger of understanding the human experience more and more was always there. I still enrolled into so many courses. Wow. You're, you're a great example for us or for our students who are looking at this to probably see why upskilling is needed in their uh, lives. Because one is you need a certain XYZ job, that's why you upskill. And the other is you need to upskill because you want different experiences in your life and you're not restricting yourself to one thing that you've learned. Oh, absolutely. And you know what, Paul? The, when I shifted from medicine to Reiki, to NLP, to hypnotherapy, and then to DEI, I thought, are they going to be all unrelated? Hmm. Today, I find I'm able to amalgamate them all. Right. When I, let's say when I do a woman's journey, I do something called a whole being woman leadership program. Hmm. And the physical health, the emotional health, the business acumen, I combine it all together and all my various disciplines, come, I, I love it because all my various disciplines come together there. Mm -hmm. So whatever new you're learning, it's your creativity, how you can blend it into your actual field of work. Right. I think you can blend anything, you mm -hmm. know, even if you learn cooking, you can blend it to what you do. Absolutely. You learn music, you can blend it to what you do. It's just your ability to synthesize. Government offices are a different beast altogether, right? Once you walk in, there is a, I mean, this is from my experience, is a, there's a familiar smell that you get of that place. <laughs> there's a familiar, uh, you know, the kind of lighting, the kind of decor, the kind of people who are sitting there. Decor. It just <laughs> changes. I, I mean, the, the moment you walk into a very fancy private corporate office and the moment you uh, into a enter a bank, it's a totally <laughs> different world. <laughs> Two different worlds, right? So, you know, the, the spaces that you have worked in, how different are these two worlds in your opinion? 
Look, there was always a frustration in a government office that to move one file, it will take you one year. Hmm. Uh, unless you would say, I will pick up the file myself and move it from <laughs> table to table. I've done that many a times. Uh. Uh, that's the only way it happens. It took me years before I got, I wanted to voluntary retirement. It took me years before I got that. It took me years for me, for my pension to be activated. Uh. A lot of effort. Yeah, that's another story, by the way. That the the uh, it was the office was on the third floor. I couldn't climb the third floor. Okay. Therefore, it took me about four years for my pension to be activated. I did not get it. Not my gratuity, my pension, nothing came because I could not climb those floors. I would take one of my family members and say, "You go and do it," but it was very slow. So, about accessibility and inclusion, yeah. that's another story of accessibility and inclusion. So, it takes a long time, but I really think things are changing in that direction. The government is doing work. It takes, for systems to change completely, it takes time. But it is definitely improving. The government offices are definitely improving. We are nowhere near perfection right now, mm. but the change is happening. After many years, I'm seeing that the change is happening. Well, the government uh, and actually the government is a model inclusive employer. Do you know that? Okay. Can you explain? Many of the positions which are filled <coughs> by entrance exams, mm. that itself is big inclusion. Mm. Uh, do you know that there is a two year childcare leave for women in yeah. the government? Yeah for each for two children so total of four years, four years. Mm. and you can take it any time till the child is 18 years of age that's a huge very big policy and the government is not scared about pushbacks what will our leaders say what will our employees say mm. what will our managers say the government is not scared about that once they say that this is a policy then that policy is implemented right so in many ways there are strengths as well it's not this is all good and this is all bad. There are plenty of strengths as well. I would say there are plenty of strengths as well. Right. Speaking of government, um, you have been an active part of elections. You have been an active part of the ECI. You have been a national icon for ECI and you have worked extensively with the government for accessibility of the PWD um, category voters to come on and vote. And this is the voting season. Uh, we all know about that. Let's set some light on that from the time when you have worked there and the time that we are seeing right now, probably one or two elections, I'm not sure how long you were there. No, it's been uh, four years now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you see any difference in the way the voters are brought into the polling booths? Did you see them being treated equal? with the other yeah, voters yeah. who were there? Absolutely, big difference. So for example, uh, small things. There is a barrier when you come into a polling booth. They're usually in government schools. Mm. And there is a police barricade. And from there, the person with disability is supposed to make their way in. Earlier, there used to be nothing. Mm. I mean, you just had to walk mm. or don't come. Then they started having uh, wheelchairs, rickety, terrible wheelchairs which cannot withstand the Indian roads. More torture than a benefit. Then some places you started having shuttles. But it was, it was not at all a convenient thing for a person with disability. Then there are, if you have a ramp and there is a nala or a gadda, mm. a pit hole right in front of the ramp, What's the big idea? Or if the ramp is this steep, or you have a big planter right on top of the ramp, what's the big idea? So all such things used to happen. Anyway, the ramp was made much later. But those ramps were not usable. Then the sensitization of the personnel was terrible. I mean, I remember once I went to vote and somebody shouting on top, are you handicapped? Hai? Dekh lo. It was so embarrassing and so humiliating. Mm -hmm. What's the idea of a ramp if you do something like that? Yeah. 
then we started having change. So when I became the national icon, the chief election commissioner at that time was Sunil Arora ji. Mm. And ever since that, each of the chief election um, commissioners who's come and I've worked very closely with all of them, Rajiv Kumar ji now, they were sincerely, totally dedicated to bringing the change. And I think I was among the first people they started talking to and asking questions as to what can be done. I started giving video messages to encourage voters to come. So all that happened and then after that a whole advisory committee was set up. Then there is an app called the Suction app that has now been created yeah. for people with disabilities to register themselves and know everything. Then EVM started coming in Braille, interpreters started coming, volunteers started coming. Postal ballet, that means you can vote from home. Yeah, that's, very important. That's huge, mm. the postal ballet initiative, that's huge. All of this started coming bit by bit, bit by bit coming into place. Today we can say that the polling experience for people with disabilities is such a respectful experience and it is an authentically inclusive and accessible experience. Great. Uh, Again, because we're talking about elections, um, you know, in 2011 census data that is available, almost 2.8 uh, crore people were in the PWD category where, who were the voters, right? Which was roughly around 2% of the population at that time. Uh, you know, we see a lot of products coming in from both public and private players, but we don't hear much about products catering to these very people to make their lives easier. Is it because it's not a need for a larger mass or is it because it's not profitable that companies don't think about? Both of the things. Even to make a premises accessible is a huge cost investment. Mm. Mm. And people shy away because those buildings are made. What do you do? Now you want to revamp the whole building? It's Correct. expensive. Mm. Then digital software, it's expensive. See, true accessibility means you have to look into the smallest of things that where's the coffee machine? Is the person able to access the coffee machine? Yeah. Or let's say you have to consider all kinds of disabilities. Let's say there's a short person. Does the, the soap vending machine, is it on a level? Mm. Yeah. So all those things have to be taken. And that's a lot. That needs a lot of thought. It needs a lot of uh, intention and investment whether we are ready to do that. The products that you speak of, absolutely right. See, I wear a brace in my leg. I have to go to Jaipur for it. Mm. There is, we don't have any place in Delhi where it matches my needs. Okay. So it's, it's available in very few places, right? And there are several such orthoses or equipment. So Santokba Hospital, which was under Dr. P.K. Sethi in Jaipur. Phenomenal. Now it is led by Dr. Anil Jain. They have done tremendous work and they are catering to a lot of people from all sectors of society because it's also affordable. So that also has to be kept in mind that it's progressive and affordable mm. for people to be able to access. A lot of work yet to be done in that area. Do, do you see um, that happening by or that is being taken up by corporates and showing interest in that? See, corporates will only do it if it is a good money making hmm. business. Hmm. Hmm. So, again, if you take a condition like polio, hmm. it's only, it was in, in India, now it's been eradicated, what's the future of business in it? Correct. Yeah. So, they're not going to invest in much research and much progression in that, they're not going to do that. It depends upon need to need to need to need. Hearing aids, yes, a lot of people need hearing aids, mm. so you invest in that. Mm. Uh, if it's only a country specific need, again, you'll have less, less amount of research and work done on it. So I think it should be more also the government doing it, the non-profits doing it, which they are. Yeah. Which they are. It needs to be stepped up. Understood. Uh, let's now come to our third vertical of this particular conversation that I wanted to have with you about the people, the Gen Z's who are walking into workplaces. Mm -hmm. Now that we have set precedents now that you have worked for these many years, now probably you will pass on the baton to the next generation to think about how they want their ideal workplaces to be. Yeah. 
How do you see that workplace turning out to be? Yeah. So, you know, like I said that every country has its own challenges, every generation has its own challenges. Mm. True. So when we say that, very often people say, oh, Gen Z, they're much more inclusive. And yes, if we talk about color discrimination, you people will uh, object. You will say, even to your parents, you'll say, don't talk like that. If we talk about LGBTQ people, you'll say, don't talk like that. All that, if we talk about body shaming, you're the first advocates to say, don't talk about that. But then there are other issues. Gen Z has an information overload. Gen Z is spoiled for choices. That's confusing. That's mind-boggling. But Gen Z, is Gen Z open to taking, collaborating with other generations, taking the wisdom of other generations? Maybe that's the area they're lacking in. They are thinking that information and technology is the solution to everything, which eventually does not turn out and therefore the uh, the emotional and mental health issues in Gen Z are in fact more than any previous generation. Yeah. Why is that so? What needs to be done for that? Right? That's the Gen Z challenge. So what is the future workplaces that the Gen Z is looking forward to? I think it has yet to be figured out. But the one thing that they would need to um, probably work upon is more collaboration mm. across sectors. Acceptance is there, but collaboration needs a little more emphasis. Mm. There's a difference between acceptance and collaboration. Right. Yeah. And then we'll figure out that what is the wisdom from the past and what is the vision of the future that can be amalgamated to make a place which is physically, emotionally healthy, progressive and brings happiness because that's what we are all looking for at the end of the day. Do you think their definition of happiness is also changing? Definition of joy can change, definition of fun can change, but definition of happiness cannot change. Mm -hmm. Because happiness is hormones. Mm. We are neurochemical beings. Yeah. And we have, if serotonin is the hormone for well-being, <laughs> <laughs> then, then that doesn't change. <laughs> yeah. So if health, physical health has certain parameters that your BP, your lipids have to be at a certain parameter, that doesn't change. Yeah. So I always talk about a world where inclusion and respect for each other becomes everybody's agenda. And when it does, if it does, we might see a completely new experience of human experience than we have seen before. Do you see this generation to be more inclusive? No. If they are not ready to take in inputs from their peers or probably more younger people who are joining the workforce. How will they channelize that energy into building something that is, you know, both good for the society and the organization that they're working for? So I didn't say they were not listening. I said they're listening less. Hmm? They could listen more. Let's say that. Hmm. Hmm? So how do you become more inclusive? See, inclusion is natural to somebody. It's not natural to others. Even for those whom it is natural to, they have to work and do efforts towards making it more stable and more consistent and more sustained. If in difficult times, your inclusion goes away, out of the window, then that's not inclusion. Hmm. I do a session called resilient inclusion. Are you able to maintain your higher brain? Are you able to keep your higher brain online? even in most critical moments because times are going to be critical more and more in the future. And are you able to be inclusive even then? Are you able to provide psychological safety to everyone around you to be able to voice their opinions and then take their inputs and see how you can integrate it into success? Right. 
that's what's needed. That muscle uh, needs to be built by everyone. Mm -hmm. You can't say this person does it naturally and this person does not. Everyone needs to go through maybe a curriculum, education. See, I went to Labasna, the Civil Services Institute of India, for a keynote. Mm -hmm. And I said, these are the architects of our country. Why is it not there in their curriculum? DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion. It was such a coincident director says, oh, we're designing the curriculum right now. Can you stay back? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said yes, I will. And then we actually integrated that into the curriculum. We did mm. an entire train the trainer for the entire faculty. Now it's part of the curriculum. Wow. So it has to be part of curriculum. There has to be a lot more emphasis from educational institutes, from organizations to make equip people on inclusion, whichever generation. Absolutely. Uh, and that brings me to this question of, you know, tapping the real resource that we have when we include these people. So, for example, oh, it's a 50-50 split between the two genders that we know of. I mean, because we kind of put it under an umbrella of two gender specifically and we don't have exact numbers for the LGBTQI community. Uh, and of that 50% workforce that we have of women, we see a paltry number of 7 to 10% in the workforce. I mean, the numbers can vary here and there. I'm not aware of the exact numbers right now. What are we missing out on as a country if we are keeping that? We're talking about gender now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, you know, from this International Women's Day, I've been saying something in every forum that I've had an opportunity mm -hmm. to say. I travel all around the world. The ambition, the passion, the hard work and the versatility that I see in Indian women, I say nowhere in the world. But the barriers to them are still so many mm. that what I spoke about in the beginning, eventually exhaustion sets in. Correct. Then they ask me this question, Dr. Neeru, is it even worth it? Mm. Okay, I'm going to go a step further because I do a large number of women journeys. So thousands of women in a year, which I'm interacting at one to one level. So the women's journey I do looks like this, that we have workshops, we have coaching calls, we have diagnostics. We have one exercise on limiting beliefs. That's the first exercise I do with them. Paul, you're going to be surprised at the anguish that comes out there. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I look bad. My relationships, I'll never be able to make good relationships. It's like a whole bag full which comes out there. There's a lot of catharsis, there's a lot of crying, there's a lot of emotional venting and then there is healing. And then I tell them one thing, girls this is not your baggage. This is the baggage of society. This is the baggage of patriarchy. Mm. Because often they think this is their weakness. Yeah. And then they become even more depressed about it. Why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? Why do I have such negative thoughts? Yeah. Even that becomes a pain point. Now tell me, if there is a big stone like this, these limiting beliefs tied to your feet, no matter how ambitious you are, how far will you be able to run? Mm. This needs to be addressed. Another big barrier that uh, puts women at a <clears throat> back seat, it's not only the social norms, it's not accepting, acknowledging and respecting the woman's emotional system. When the woman becomes emotional about something, she becomes upset, she starts crying. People think this is weakness. Mm. And then you think it's lack of efficiency lack of objectivity because we pay too much emphasis on objectivity and very little emphasis on emotions. The greatest asset becomes the greatest drawback. This needs to change. Wow, beautiful. Uh, one last question. Uh, did life change after Padma Shri? Yes. It did? Oh, wow, that's a good last question. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, it changed. Um, so what the, the, the time that I was going to receive the Padma Shri, when I was walking up to the president, suddenly my own whole life 
looked like a story which had been written somewhere. That it was always meant to be this and the purpose was this. See, anyway, I used to say, I'm employed by the universe. Hmm. And I felt, feel that, I felt that for a very long time. So, it suddenly made sense. Those two minutes stretched into such a long duration. And after that, I became more responsible. Because what I started seeing was that my voice was now heard more than before. Hmm. The message that the Padma Shri has given me to go on as long as I can. Sometimes sacrifice anybody, I think, who's working for a cause or a purpose, uh, whether it is people in the army or activists or leaders, anybody who's working for a cause, there are a few personal sacrifices you have to make. We continue to make those sacrifices because that's what we were born for. With great power comes great responsibility and I hope that you keep on doing what you are doing. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for you know giving us so much time and talking to us for this particular episode of Conversations with Gabby Podcast. It really kind of opened my eyes about certain things that uh, we kind of not see or choose not to see mm. and probably that happens to the audience who is listening to this conversation as well. Mm. Once again, thank you very, very it's been, much. It's been really nice talking to you, Paul, and talking to students and talking to young people. I am. Uh, I always have the urge to be able to instill one message that the humanity can be a very different experience than it has been so far. If inclusion is truly imbibed, you can see a completely new life experience. Absolutely. And if you do agree with what Dr. Niru has said or you agree with the ideas that she has shared on this particular podcast, do share this particular video. Uh, do comment as to what you feel uh, is the need of the R and if you belong to one of these Gen Z's that we talked about, do tell us what your ideal workplace should look like. Thank you once Thank again, you. Dr. D. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Thank you.